general discussion of cancer. And next semester is when we'll do uh, specific types of cancer, you know, breast, prostate, and so on. All right. Um, a cancer actually develops from a normal somatic cell. So a cancer cell is nothing but a normal somatic cell that has undergone some changes in its genomic makeup. So you have a change in its genome such that the cell now focuses on just growth, nothing but growth. Okay. It doesn't care about function. And when you are talking about cancer chemotherapy, uh, the word differentiation becomes important. So a cancer cell basically has no differentiation. So when you say that a cancer is undifferentiated, that means it is an aggressive or severe cancer. When it is undifferentiated, which basically means it does nothing but grow. It doesn't care about the function. And so that somatic cell that has changed in terms of its genome can develop what is called angiogenesis. So in other words, it has the capability to produce some small blood cells. And through those uh, blood vessels, not blood cells, blood vessels, through those blood vessels, it can attract nutrients to itself. That's why it just uh, grows profusely, profusely. And it is because of the angiogenesis that a cancer can move from one local site to a different uh, site, or what you call metastasis. Um, the changed cell is now able to avoid your immune system, so it can evade the actions of your immune system, and that's why it survives. Then it has the property of contact inhibition. In other words, uh, the reason you don't have ears on your cheeks is because when your, the cells of your ears grow to the point of meeting the cells of your cheeks, they start growing. That's contact inhibition. So the cells of your ears come into contact with the cells of your cheeks. They will know that's, that, that's a boundary there, and that's when they will stop. But a cancer cell has lost the uh, property of contact inhibition. That's why it can grow and override your normal cells. It just keeps growing and uh, destroying everything in its pathway. Okay. Now, the change that we talked about in your normal somatic cell would have an initiator, something that started that change. That's the initiator. For instance, it could be a virus. Uh, we've talked about your Epstein-Barr virus that can cause your buckets to the forearm. Uh, may even call your 
radial or nasopharyngeal cancer. And we've talked about the HTLDs, uh, you know, part of your uh, retroviruses that can even cause breast cancer. Okay, so we know there are viruses that can cause cancer. We've talked about HH8, or HHV8, human herpes virus 8, which we said has been implicated in Kaposi's sarcoma. Kaposi's sarcoma is a type of cancer. So you can have an initiator, even the uh, sun rays, the ultraviolet rays from the sun can initiate that change, uh, say, on the skin when uh, you're about to have skin cancer. And so once the initiator changes the genome, then a promoter now perpetrates, now makes that changed cell to proliferate. Uh, for instance, uh, if you look at something like alcohol, alcohol can be a promoter. Hormones can be a promoter you know, like your estrogens, for instance. So you have an initiator, and then you have a promoter. Now, just because a cell has changed in that manner does not mean that it will be malignant. So the cell can change and proliferate or grow without becoming malignant. In that way, you, I mean, at that point, you just call it a tumor, okay? When the tumor now becomes malignant, that's when you use the word cancer, okay? Usually, the tumor has a, a suffix of oma. That would be a benign tumor, okay? But when you see sarcoma, okay, that will be a malignant tumor. And you use sarcoma when you have a connective tissue involved. Okay. You use the word carcinoma or the uh, suffix carcinoma when it is an epithelial tissue that is involved. And you always uh, begin with the tissue that or the organ that is involved in that tumor. Uh, for instance, uh, if we uh, say uh, lipoma, that would be a benign tumor of the uh, lipid tissue. And then we can have a liposarcoma. Okay. That would be a malignant uh, condition of the uh, of your uh, uh, lipid tissues. There is nothing like a benign tumor of the lymph nodes. So even though you say lymphoma and it ends in oma, it is not benign. And the lymphoma is always malignant. And the same thing goes for your glial cells in the brain. You know, even though you say glioma, it is always malignant. And then, of course, if the carcinoma occurs in the gland, then you say adenocarcinoma. That would be a glandular. You know, 
that would be a glandular malignant uh, tumor. Okay, so those are the differences there. And of course, there are certain so-called cardinal signs of cancer. Uh, if you see a lump, say in the breast or in other parts of the body, that could be a sign of a tumor or cancer developing. Uh, if you have a sore that does not seem to heal, regardless of what you use to try and treat it, it could be suggestive of a cancer developing. If you have a persistent cough and hoarseness, that's another cardinal sign of cancer. Uh, if you have a mole, that has changed drastically in terms of its coloration. You know, it has become very dark, or it has changed drastically in terms of its size. That's another cardinal sign of uh, a tumor. A change in your bowel habit or in the bladder habit is another cardinal sign of uh, a cancer. An unusual discharge. You know, if you have an unusual discharge from any organ or tissue in the body, it could be uh, a telling sign of, uh, of a cancer that's developing. Okay, so. Once we determined that a cancer has occurred, if it's localized, then you refer to it as in situ. That is, it's just localized, it's at one spot. You detect it that early, you just aggregate. That is, you just cut it out you excise the cancer, and that's the end of it. Okay, but if it's not uh, diagnosed or found when it was inside to then it can grow, force to local tissues, and then into the nodes, and from there it can metastasize to other parts of the body. And then the modalities uh, that you use to address that condition. Well, one, one can use surgery, of course, if it's uh, still localized, or if it's easy to cut, uh, or one can use radiation, that would be another modality that one can use, and then of course we can use chemotherapy uh, as another modality. Uh, they have basically tried to separate immunotherapy from uh, chemotherapy. Those are basically the four modalities that you have, and the one that we are concerned with, of course, would be chemotherapy. And if you're going to use drugs to treat cancer, then you have to pick from many of the categories or classes of drugs that are uh, available. Uh, you have your alkylating agents. Okay. And uh, you have your anti metabolites. Those are just some of them. Uh, your anti 
antibiotics, some plant derived drugs, uh, your platinum complex, or platinum coordinate complex. And you have hormones that you can pick from. And you have some agents that are anti-mitotic agents. Okay. So you have different classes of your know, anti-cancer drugs. Uh, the two that we will be discussing are your alkylate agents and the anti-metabolites. Okay. And then um, Dr. Zhang would come in and discuss some other agents. Okay, so today we're starting off with the alkylating agents. And the alkylating agents, I'll uh, list them here. Uh, the one that we will take as the representative agent will be your cyclophosphamide. And so, uh, cyclophosphamide is uh, probably the most often used alkylating agent in cancer chemotherapy. And uh, that's because of certain reasons. Uh, one, the drug uh, is useful in many forms of cancer. So in other words, it has a relatively broad spectrum of what's in the type of uh, cancer. And it has many groups of administration, so you have choices. And it does not produce your so-called acute CMS syndrome. Many of your anti-cancer drugs have that acute CNS effect. You know, uh, you look at 5 FU, it can give you acute cerebellar syndrome, ACS. Acute cerebellar syndrome, if you look at your methotrexate, it's highly neurotoxic. So it can give you leukoencephalitis uh, and so on. So, uh, Cyclophosphamide is attractive because it doesn't have that acute uh, CMS syndrome. And it is not a vesicant, which basically means that it does not produce uh, blisters. So you don't have blistering when you administer that drug. So, um, for those reasons, the drug is very uh, attractive, and that's why we pick it as the representative agent of your alkylating uh, agents. And uh, we'll uh, look at its pharmacology in a second. I will just mention some of the uh, uses and classes of these other agents. Uh, if you go from one to number six, those are the so-called nitrogen mustards. You know, nitrogen mustards. And the original one was actually that methylorhythamine. You know, that was the original nitrogen mustard before all these other drugs came in. Uh, the uh, phosphamide is very close to cyclophosphamide, but it is never administered by itself. You have to deal with it with comes out the acid with mesna which is a substance that can reduce uh, some of these adverse effects. Uh, 
methylrhythamine, your vesicles, and Hodgkin's and non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Hodgkin's and non Hodgkin's lymphoma. That's what that drug is mainly used for. There's, there's a certain regimen that is called a MOP regimen. The M in MOP regimen is the methylrhythamine. Um, and that's what we'll be talking about mostly, that is uh, combination drugs, combination regimens. You seldom see a single drug used to treat cancer today. It's always a combination. So combination regimens, that's what we'll be uh, looking at today. Okay. Uh, Melphalan. Melphalan is used or is useful in the management of multiple myeloma. Okay, that's what my M stands for. Multiple myeloma. And it is useful in ovarian cancer and it is useful also in the treatment of breast cancer. Okay. Uh, Chlorambucil is a nitrogen mustard that is uh, most often used for CLL, that is your chronic lymphocytic leukemia. That's what he is promising uh, for, uh, mostly. Uh, Lindellus is one that you use for leomyoma. But particularly in leomyosarcoma. Thyroid, 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 
the way for Sora Mahir. So, bell tape uh, is used for arm, bladder, liver, and breast cancer. Particularly, this uh, CNU, CCNU, uh, metal CCNU, and streptozerosin. Those are your nitrosoluries. Those are your nitrosoluries, this chloro, ethyl nitrosoluria. That's what the so this chloro nitrosoluria, the CCNU will be chloroethyl and cyclohexyl nitrosoluria. The third form of your CCNU is your metal CCNU. Uh, you can see those as carnustin okay, and low mustin and semustin. BCNU, CCNU, and metal CCNU. Carnustin, robustin, and semustin. Uh, out of the nitrosoluries, uh, BCNU is the one that is most often used. It can help with brain cancer. In fact, all the nitrosoluries are good for brain cancer. Uh, in BCNU, you can also see used in Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and uh, can also see it used in Bucky's lymphoma. So it is good in that uh, regard. You can see it used in multiple myeloma. So, the streptozerosin, that is a drug that affects the pancreas a lot. So it is used for what you call insulinoma, pancreatic insulinoma. Uh, it's a drug that uh, can just destroy uh, the, the pancreas. If you want to do research in diabetes, that's a drug that you can use. You inject it into the rabbit. It destroys the pancreas of the rabbit. The blood sugar will go up, and you inject your own drug to see if it will bring sugar down. Uh, we used that a lot a few years ago. Okay, uh, the tick uh, is a triazin. That is, it is actually di uh, methyl triazinol carboxamide. So uh, the idea is imidazole, which you can put anywhere. So dimethyl triazinol. That's what your detect is. And you can see it as the carbazin. All right. And uh, the tick is very good for sarcoma, especially soft tissue sarcoma. And if you're talking about soft tissue sarcoma, you, you're looking at conditions like your uh, liposarcoma, for instance. Liposarcoma, that's an example of a soft tissue uh, sarcoma. Your angio sarcoma is another one. Uh, Kaposi is another example. Sarcoma is another example of the soft tissue 
uh, sarcoma. So you see uh, the tick uh, used a lot in such conditions. Right. So now we can focus on the cyclophosphamide, the main agent. The mechanism of action of cyclophosphamide uh, begins with the uh, liver. So if you have cyclophosphamide, it can be metabolized by the hepatic enzyme in your cyclophosphamide uh, 450 system to the 4-hydroxy cyclophosphamide. And then that can be further metabolized to uh, your uh, carboxy or keto first, uh, for keto cyclophosphamide. The four keto cyclophosphamide is useless. In other words, it's not uh, clinically relevant. The four hydroxy cyclophosphamide can undergo telematic shift. That is telematic conversion to amino phosphoramide. And so that's a non enzymatic pathway. The amino phosphoramide can be metabolized to carboxyphosphoramide by an uh, uh, enzyme, but it can also be broken down in a non-enzymatic fashion to just your phosphoramide and to acronym. So you see with cyclophosphamide, the enzymatic pathway yields non uh, clinically viable compounds. But the non enzymatic pathway is what will yield what is cytotoxic. So the phosphoramide is what will alkylate your DNA in the cancer cells. Okay. The acrolyne is what is responsible for the main adverse effect of that drug. Uh, which is hemorrhagic cystitis. Okay. So when it is used in cancer, it is that uh, phosphoramide moiety. And so that's why we say that the activation of cyclophosphamide occurs in the liver, not in the tumor cell. Your anti-metabolites like 5 FU, like methotrexate, 6 MP, all of those are activated inside the tumor cell, not in the liver. Okay. Question: um, Were the cyclotoxins going from the 4 hydroxy to the 4 keto? You're saying that's an enzymatic pathway that really is not useful in terms of how. Right. This is an enzymatic pathway. What it yields is non-viable clinical. In other words, it's an inactive metabolite. Okay. So the non-enzymatic pathway is the telematic shift pathway that produces the aldo. And then the aldo can be metabolized by an aldase, uh, you know, an enzyme that will give you carboxy phosphoramide 
That is useless also. It's an inactive metabolite. But this too, phosphoramide and acrolein undergo a non-enzymatic pathway. And those are the active moieties. Okay. So that's how your uh, cyclophosphamide works. In terms of its ADNA, uh, we know that the drug can be D1, POIVIM, IP, and it can also be administered intraplural, just within the plural cavity of the chest. This we can now cancel because the PO form is no longer available. Okay. So these other ones are the rules, the current rules of administration of your uh, cyclophosphamide. In terms of its half-life, uh, it's about six to seven hours uh, for the half-life. The plasma protein binding is relatively uh, low. It's about 36% plasma protein bound. It can be acted upon by your cytochrome P450 uh, to B6. Okay, so that is a substrate for that uh, cyclochrome P450. And in terms of uh, its expression, uh, it goes out, of course, primarily through the renal system. Okay. The adverse effects. We have to leave the implications to the last because that's where the main work is. The adverse effects uh, for all these anti cancer drugs, you always have a particular adverse effect that can make you change therapy with that uh, drug. And that is what, what we call the TLT, the therapy limiting toxicity, the therapy limiting toxicity of the drug. For cyclophosphamide, it is hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic cystitis. And you can prevent or manage that hemorrhagic cystitis by one, hydrating the patient, giving a lot of fluid. Just like we mentioned under amphotericin B, uh, once, if, once you have oligiuria, you're actually going towards renal dysfunction. Okay? And so in this situation, you hydrate the patient, you can decrease uh, the incidence of that hemorrhagic cystitis. The other thing you can do is administer mesna. This same mesna that is always given with a phosphamide. That mesna will bind to acrolein. Remember we looked at the toxicity of the uh, mechanism of action of your cyclophosphamide. So the acrolein that is produced is the one that is mostly responsible for this hemorrhagic cystitis. If you give mesna, mesna will neutralize that acrolein. And so you can avoid getting hemorrhagic cystitis. And um, you can also use, well, let's put it in a question form. What is the antidote 
for a certain amount of time. No. Okay. We promised a certain system. Okay. That same new promise that you use for download can also be used to prevent or manage hemorrhagic cystitis that comes from your cyclophosphamide. So that is one in terms of its adverse effects. SIADH, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, is another adverse effect, which means one of its indications would have to be diabetes insipidus. The drug is highly emetogenic. Okay. So that's one of the drugs that Zofran actually saved. You know, because there was talk of removing cyclophosphamide because of that excessive vomiting. Okay. And then suddenly Zofran came on the market and it saved your cyclophosphamide, it also saved your cisplatin. So the drug is highly emetogenic, and it is teratogenic. So it can affect the fetus. It is also mutagenic. So that is what can then lead to cancer. So almost every drug you use to treat cancer can cause cancer. Okay. And uh, the drug can produce a lot of alopecia, okay. loss of hair. Three, 
we can use it when you are uh, transplanting a tissue to prevent that host versus graft uh, reaction. So those are uh, some, some indications uh, for the drug. In case you don't want an individual to have babies, okay, that is a sterility, will actually say the mothers of, of females live, you can also use that cyclophosphamide because it can affect the gonads and produce some sterility. So that can be an adverse effect, but it can also be used uh, in a clinical sense. Okay. Now for the cancer indications. You can use it to treat breast cancer. You can use it for ovarian cancer. It is helpful in corneal carcinoma. It has some activity in your pockets lymphoma. two types, SCLC and NSCLC. Small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, cyclophosphamide is used more often in the non-small cell lung cancer. It has a little activity for in your SCLC or small cell lung cancer. Okay. And it is also effective in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. That's another indication. And you can use it in uh, sarcoma, particularly in soft tissue. Soft tissue sarcoma. And then it is useful in the management of multiple myeloma. There is a combination now today that is called uh, hyper c -Lad. You have hyper c A and hyper c B. Uh, that combination is used to treat ALL acute lymphocytic leukemia. And uh, the C in c is actually cyclophosphamide. You know, so it's a relatively uh, new indication for cyclophosphamide. So we say it can be used to treat acute lymphocytic leukemia. Um, that's A. The difference between hypocela A and hypocela B is that in B you have what you have in A plus methotrexate and cytarabine 
is your arrow C. So you give it hyper C by A. Um, and then you alternate it with hyper C by B. And when you used both for 28 days, that's when you say you have a complete cycle of your hypercela when you're using it to treat acute hypercela leukemia. All right, so like we said, um, you don't see drugs used singly uh, anymore except if the condition has really gone out of hand and you just want to use a drug as a last resort uh, for the management of the cancer. And so we will look at the combinations that you can say used for breast cancer. And next semester, uh, when we are doing specific cancer disorders, the breast cancer is the one we'll start with. And the different combinations that you can use for breast cancer, you see it's a whole lot of them, goes all the way to this number 18. Okay, and uh, you don't press the panic button uh, because they are kind of repetitive, and within a day or two, you'll be very familiar with these combination therapies. So the AC regimen, you have adriamycin and cyclophosphamide. Adriamycin is also called doxorubicin. It's one of your antibiotics that you use in cancer. Okay. So that's AC, adramycin and cyclophosphamide, and ACD is adramycin cyclophosphamide, and that D is docetaxel, this drug right here. Docetaxel. And docetaxel is one of your Taxins. So you have paclitaxel and you have docetaxel. And you have cabazitaxel. That's another one. You have abraxin. Abraxin is actually a different a different formulation of paclitaxel that does not use uh, a solvent uh, that often causes reactions, you know, hypothesis gives you reactions and stuff. So, abraxin is like paclitaxel, but without that solvent. And uh, the taxins originally came from the, what is called the Pacific yew tree. It's a tree that is found in the Northwest of the US, so Washington State, Oregon, uh, and to some extent, Idaho. Okay. Um, so uh, the taxons are really very prominent in cancer chemotherapy. Okay, then you have ACT, adramycin, cyclophosphamide, and that T is Taxol. Taxol is the other name for your Paclitaxel. Okay, so it's a taxin. When cells are divided, you know, proliferating, 
you have to have um, your microtubules come together. That's what you call assembly. Okay. And after they come together, then they have to disperse. That's what you call disassembly. The toxins tend to prevent the disassembly of microtubules. Okay, in other words, they cause stabilization. If you stabilize the microtubules, you will not get cellular division, and so the cancer cell will die. Okay. So that's how the toxins actually work. Uh, there's another class called epotelons. The epotelons also inhibit disassembly. And uh, epithelons are also used in cancer, uh, breast cancer. There's only one in that group right now. That's exempra. You know, uh, exempra is an example of an epithelon, and it affects microtubular disassembly. Okay, so we can go on. Then tap. The T here is not taxol. The T is taxotere. Taxotere is that's the taxol. Okay, so it is a taxin. So in act, the T is taxol. In tac, the T is dusty taxin or taxotere. In ACTH, here you have the same thing that you have in ACT, that is adriamycin, cyclophosphamide, and you know, taxol, or paclitaxel. And the H here is Herceptin. And you know, Herceptin, The Herceptin is a HER2 inhibitor. That's where you have the Herceptin, HER receptor, Herceptin. It's a HER2 inhibitor. And uh, HER actually refers to human epidermal growth factor. growth factor receptor. So HER2 inhibitor is Herceptin. The generic name for Herceptin is Trastuzumab. Okay. So Trastuzumab is the generic name, Herceptin is the brand name, and that's what you have in ACTH. You see, the E there is epirubicin. Epirubicin is one of your antibacterials or antibiotics that you use in cancer chemotherapy. We can mention some of them. Uh, we have dendrorubicin, we have epirubicin. So rubicin, which is you know, uh, adriamycin, uh, that's one that is called mitomycin, okay. and nephromycin is another one. Uh, those are some of your antibiotics that are used in cancer chemotherapy. FEC, 
the F is factor euro cell. So that's factor euro cell, and then you have epirubicin and saprophosphamide. And FECT is what you have in FECT, with the D there being your, um, the, the um, taxin that we, we talked about before, does the tax cell. Okay. Fact, straightforward, 5-FU is the mycin, cyclophosphamide, and CAF is the same thing as fat, but reversed. In other words, the sequence of administration is reversed. In fact, we start with 5-FU, in CAF, we actually end with 5-FU. So it's just the sequence that is changed. IMF. The idea is a phosphamide, that or the arteriolating agent, right there. And whenever you see a phosphamide, you know mesna must be there, because it has to be given with mesna. Okay? Even though it's not actually reflected here. So I is a phosphamide, M is methotrexate, you know, which is one of your anti-metabolites that we will discuss next. And uh, of course, F is part of the fuel. CFM is cyclophosphamide, part of the fuel, that's for your cell. And the M there is not methotrexate. It's mitoxanthron. And Mitoxanthron is also Novantron. Okay. And uh, you'll see that in NFL. Okay. That N for NFL is Novantron, which is the same thing as that uh, Mitoxanthron. So, and we'll just go down here. So, that's for CFM, CMF. Sacrophosphamide, methotrexate, that's the M here, methotrexate, and 5-fluorouracil. Cooper's regimen is a very popular regimen for treating breast cancer. And what it contains is actually your CMFDP, okay? So you know what the CMF is already, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, find a few. This V here is vincristin. And vincristin is one of your vinca alkaloids. So you have the crystal, the essen, the blasting, the neuralgin. Assembly. Um, 
Bishop Foley, that he is as an anchor form delegate, thanks to the assembly. Okay, so uh, those are your uh, winter alkaloids. And uh, that's what you had in Cooper's regiment, the Christian. And the P there is actually prednisone. So when we talked last semester about one of the uses of your adrenosteroid hormones is uh, the management of some cancer situations. That's one example. So prednisone is in the Cooper's regimen, and you use it for treating breast cancer. Okay. Then you have uh, bath, and for bath you have your vein twisting, you can see there, and you have adriamycin, and the T is high taper. Right here, it's taper. And the H is halo testing. And of course, if you break that down, testing testosterone. So it's a derivative of your um, androgens. Okay. That's a uh, have a tester. That's about the only time you would actually come across how testing these days. Um, it used to be used very often as your testosterone before, but this is just where you see it now. NFL, Novantron, Fatal Eurocell. And the L there is leucoborum. Leucoborum we refer to as a rescue agent. Leucoborum can protect normal cells from the deleterious effects of RNP. Okay, and you can do that also for metatrexate. Okay. So you can see it combined with fiber Q, you can see it combined with metatrexate as a rescue agent. And then you can use texadabine as a background drug or backbone drug and just combine it with one of these. So texadabine plus bevacizumab can be used for breast cancer. Uh, bevacizumab is a monoclonal antibody that is anti-vegic. The vascular endothelial growth factor. Vascular endothelial growth factor. Uh, so it can be used in combination with capsarabine, or we can use uh, the lapatinib, and of course you see the mid there. So you know we have the reverse uh, and the receptor tyros and kinase. Okay. Azempra is the only member of your epitopes. That's the one I was referring to earlier. So Azempra is, at least as of now, the only epotelon that is available and is used in combination with capsidabine. Capsidabine is one of your anti-metabolites. And uh, we'll see its uh, mechanism of action when we have that little special session because uh, it fits right there within the mechanism of action for the fiber fuel and methotrexate and so on. Okay, and this attack cell, of course, is a toxin that we have talked about. Uh, other combinations that you use for breast cancer, you can take trastuzumab 
as the backbone or the background drug, and then you can add anastrozole to it. So trastuzumab, anastrozole. Trastuzumab is another drug that is a HER2. Okay, move we'll that off. That's another HER2 inhibitor. Just like this Herceptin. Well, that, I mean, that's the drug right there. Uh, so you can have trastuzumab and nastrozole. You can have trastuzumab with vein blasting. Uh, this one here, which is one of your uh, liquor alkaloids. Then TP, trastuzumab with partuzumab. So patuzumab is also a HER2 inhibitor. So in the TP regimen, you're actually using two HER2 inhibitors. Okay. Uh, TD will be trastuzumab and docetaxel. TDP, trastuzumab, docetaxel, along with patuzumab. And then TCP is trastuzumab, Carboplatin. Along with your Pertuzumab. Uh, Carboplatin belongs to a group that you call Platinum coordination complexes. So, other members of that group would include cisplatin, okay, which is a carboplatin, that would be another one. Oxaliplatin, another April platin. Those are all uh, platinum coordination complexes. Now, even though they are not usually listed along with your alkylating agents, the mechanism of action is actually through alkylation. Uh, if you take cisplatin, for instance, you have the platinum there, and you have your and it's three and it's three there and it has two chloro there. And so it supplies, it can supply those uh, aminos uh, for the chelation of your DNA molecules. Okay, so they are usually classified by themselves as platinum coordination complexes, but the fundamental mechanism of action is actually the alkylation of the basis of your DNA. Okay. So carboplatin is uh, one of those. So. Um, That is a group that is called the TARP inhibitors. Um, that is a very effective.
certain group in the treatment of breast cancer today. And they can actually be curated in your ovarian cancer in the PARP inhibitors. Uh, PARP stands for your poly, you know, poly ADP ribose polymerase. So the power inhibitors. Um, just we can mention some examples there. Uh, one is Olapari, that's one example. Neropari, uh, they are all made in Pari. Discuss breast cancer next semester. That is the drug we will start off with. You know, all apparent when we get to uh, the drugs for breast cancer after discussing the pathophysiology of it. Okay, so that's a group that you can use for breast cancer. Uh, your cyclin dependent kinase inhibitors, CDK. Cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors, especially those that will affect cyclin-dependent kinase four and kinase six. Those can also be used for uh, breast cancer. Uh, we have one that's called Mazinio. Okay. The A 
uh, of course, it's agramycin. Okay. And the D is actually cisplatin. Because when you look at the chemical name for cisplatin, it is cis. Okay. Diamino dichloroplatinum. Okay. Uh, and we'll just show the structure there with two chloros and amino groups. Okay. So that D is what is represented here as, uh, you know, uh, cisplatin and chap. You see, we have the same thing, cytoxan or cytophosphamide, hexamethylmelanin, adriamycin, and platinum, which is cisplatin. So they essentially contain the same thing. And as I mentioned before, your PARP inhibitors can actually be curative in ovarian cancer. So you can use your PARP inhibitors or you can use carboplatin as a background drug or a uh, backbone drug and then you can just add gemcitabine. Gemcitabine is one of your antimetabolites that we will also see in that uh, mechanisms of action section. So it's very similar to your phylum field, and you see that whole structure. So it's an anti-metabolite that you can deal with this type of uh, platinum coordination complex. Okay. And we know about just taxel and pacotaxel. So you can have carboplatin plus dusty, carboplatin plus pacto for the treatment of your ovarian. Cancer. Okay. COVID carcinoma. Um, when when um, somebody is pregnant. The covering of the fetus that is just developing may detach from that growing fetus and it may lodge in a part of the body that is outside of uh, where it is supposed to be. And then it can start growing on its own. So that's a gestational defect, if you will, that can lead to a tumor, which can then become cancerous. So that's why it's choreal. And when you say carcinoma, you know it's malignant. The chorion, that's where you got the choreal from, from the chorion tissue detaches when you have a normal pregnancy. Okay. There is another condition that is called hydatidiform mold. Okay. So if you hear of molar pregnancy, that is a hydatidiform mole. What happens in that situation is during the fertilization process, when the sperm meets the ovum, there is some deficiency. And that deficiency then makes the tissue that is formed to start growing like a tumor. So they, they are both gestational disturbances of diseases. Choreocarcinoma and hydatidiform mole 
or molar pregnancy. They are both gestational diseases. One occurs during normal pregnancy, that would be the choreo carcinoma. The other, of course, because you have some kind of error when the sperm is fertilizing the ovum. Okay, so that's the only difference. The other difference, of course, is that choreo carcinoma is almost 10 times more deadly than molar pregnancy or hydratin or more. It used to be a death sentence that choreo carcinoma uh, once it was uh, discovered. Uh, but we know today now that if you use the DMC regimen, you can actually manage that choreo carcinoma. DMC, uh, you're talking about doxorubicin in some hospitals. Some other hospitals use dactylomycin, which is one of your antibiotics. Dactylomycin, of course, is the same thing as actinomycin, actinomycin D. So you simply move the D to the front to get this right name. Okay. So dactylomycin, methotrexate, and cyclophosphamide. That's the best regimen for your choreo carcinoma. And so No, it detaches, but it just lodges somewhere else. Versus where it's supposed to be. Exactly. You know. And when it gets there, it, it just starts growing. Uh, and so nine months come, and the woman doesn't have a baby, even though you still see the stomach protruding like a regular pregnancy. Would the baby still be forming in another place, or would it be there? No. Not going to be forming there. The only thing that's growing is that stuff. Yeah. Uh, but this lymphoma, uh, there's a combination regimen that works very well in, uh, uh, in buckets. And it's essentially called makeup. Okay. So you simply have your metatrexate and you have your abramycin, which is doxorubicin, uh, and you have your ara C, which is arabinocyte cytosine or saccharidin. And you have uncoding, which is a binding for the Christian, one of your um, al al alkaloids, inca alkaloids. Okay. And the last one is the doxorubicin, uh, which is adramycin. See the cyclophosphamide there that works very well in buckets. Okay. Long non Hodgkin's, just know that you can use cyclophosphamide in those situations. As we go down the line, we'll get to drugs that are very prominent or very pertinent to uh, this question of those two, and that's when we list the combination drugs. So for now, we can leave those out, but we will get to them down the road. We've done acute lymphocytic leukemia, okay. Soft tissue sarcoma, uh, Can use the hybrid regimen. Okay. So 
Sabbatic Regiment. Uh, you can use the made regiment, you can use the ID, you can use the ID uh, regiment for that soft tissue uh, sarcoma. And we can use a regiment that is called the T2 regiment. The cyber dick, if you break it down like that, you say cyclophosphamide, vancristin, adriamycin, and this DIC is the tick. That's right there. Okay. So uh, that's why we, we say it's very effective in soft tissue uh, sarcoma. The main regimen contains that mesna with a phosphamide, okay, which is right there, a phosphamide with mesna, okay, and the M here is actually mesna to prove with that a phosphamide, okay, and then A is adriamycin. And the D is Dacabazin, which is the tit. So that's what we have in that one. ID, a phosphamide with mesna, and D is your doxone, which is adramycin, and IE, you have a phosphamide, and the T, I mean the E there, is a topocyte, okay. which is one of the topoisomerase 2 inhibitors. That's what you can use for your soft tissue. The T2 regimen. is actually four cycles. Uh, Dactinomycin plus doxorubicin. That's what you will start with for the first leg of that uh, regimen. And then you use doc, which is your doxorubicin and oncogen. Oncogen, of course, is your vincristin. And you see there, the cytoxan or cyclophosphamide. And then you use two OC regimens, that is oncogen, cyclophosphamide, and then you finish up with oncogen, cyclophosphamide. So that's the T2 uh, regimen for uh, sarcoma, for soft tissue sarcoma. And and finish up with your uh, multiple myeloma. For multiple myeloma, you use the L2 regimen. And uh, you can also uh, use the uh, MP regimen. And one can also use the VP regimen, or you can take dexamethasone, and make that a backbone drug, okay. and you can uh, 
add to it, that is one each, uh, a field of him,
dexamethasone, and then you use the pristine and platinum. And P, M is methyl. Right there. M is methyl, and P is actually prednisone in that situation. And then lastly, N2 regimen. You can tell from the three names right there. Uh, those are your uh, proterozoan inhibitors. You know, Hafezomid, Isozomid, and Batizomid, they inhibit proterozoan uh, within the cell, and that's how they can prevent the proliferation of your cancer cell. And of course, the other two are monoclonal antibodies. So the cancer cell will basically be serving as an antigen, and then you're providing an antibody to that antigen. That's how those two will work. And your M2 regimen, um, Basically, it's like CMC, CMC VP. That's what the M2 regimen is. The first C there is cyclophosphonide. Then you have the M, that's metaprexid. And the other C is this chloroethyl nitrosoluria, that is PCMG. And uh, your V, of course, is the Christian, and P is prednisone. And that's your N2 regimen that you use for the multiple myeloma. Okay, we'll hold it there. And let's have questions. The aphosphamide, you, you don't see it come alone. They come and they already made it together. Is that because they're prone to making the good? Because, yeah, because they don't even want the hemorrhagic cystitis to occur at all. You know, cyclophosphamide is an old, old drug. You know, so, uh, but like we said, we can reverse the hemorrhagic cystitis by giving this plasma alone, along with the cyclophosphamide. But anytime you give a phosphomide, you're supposed to give laser. Yeah. So I think yeah. it's a pretty much um, cyclophosphomide and iphosphomide are pretty much laser kind of goes hand in hand with those. Yeah, iphosphomide does not have the spectrum that cyclophosphomide has. In other words, cyclophosphomide works in more cancer situations than iphosphomide. They both affiliate in your DNA. Okay. Any other questions? Hydroxyuridine, 5 prime, 4 hydroxyuridine, hydroxyuridine, 
policy you hear all of them, including um, the Brexit, and the Brexit, and the Brexit, you know. Okay, it says we'll see you around.